Hello and welcome back to Leader Up, a podcast of Army Management Staff College. Leader Up is a professional conversation where we discuss a broad range of leadership and leader development topics with an emphasis on the Army civilian profession. I'm your host, David Howie. On today's episode of Leader Up, we've got a very special guest, and I know our Leader Up audience will be interested and excited to hear what he's got to say. This is Mr. Daniel Klipstein, and he is a member of the Senior Executive Service, and he is the Army's Assistant Deputy Chief of Staff, G9. And we're going to talk to Mr. Klipstein today about G9, what that is, and what their role is. And also, we're going to talk about some other uh, leadership and leader development topics. And so, uh, Mr. Daniel Klipstein, thank you for being on Leader Up and welcome. Hey, David, thank you for having me. Uh, it's really a great opportunity and a privilege to talk to the members of our Army Civilian Corps. So I really look forward to the uh, conversation. Okay, thank you, sir, for your time. We we really do appreciate and I know our uh, Leader Up audience appreciates it as well. And so let me just kind of start off uh, big picture wise, this organization that that you're a part of the the leadership of the G nine. What what is the G nine, and and what is their role? Yeah, thanks, David. You know, I'm always happy to talk about the uh, the organization. the uh, The deputy chief of staff G nine installations uh, was really born out of what was formerly called the assistant chief of staff for installations management, or AXIM. Uh, which which was part of the Army staff for many years, up until uh, about September of 2019, when the uh, chief and secretary redesignated AXIM to be uh, the deputy chief of staff G9. But with that name change came, uh, came also a change of roles and responsibilities. So in terms of structure, the G9 is on par with all the other staff members of the, of the Army staff. And uh, as a result of that, uh, rebranding, if you will. Uh, We have a modified mission and a vision and the role that we play across the installation enterprise. And I'm sure I'll get to that in a few minutes. But, uh, you know, the G9 is still led by a three-star general officer, in this case, uh, Lieutenant General Jason Evans. But the mission of the G9 uh, is really encapsulated by the fact that we administer to the installation or the II PEG, the uh, program executive group. We lead the Army's quality of life effort and we implement, we integrate, we supervise, and we assess the execution of the policies and the plans uh, of re- and the resources and the programs across the installations enterprise to enable our, uh, our Army to have a ready and prompt and sustained land dominance through, insta- through the installations. Our vision uh, as a G9 and, and the vision that's been, that uh, General Evans uh, pushes uh, across our, our uh, organization is that our Army civilians and the uniformed members of our organization are the professional experts that champion installation readiness and deliver unmatched quality of life for our people. So within the G9, we have about 285 uh, people, of which only 25 are are, uh, uniformed members. Uh, And that includes the the director and the sergeant's major. um, And the rest... Uh, well over 260 are our members of our Army Civilian Corps. And so we focus all those uh, folks on the policies and the in- and integration and oversight that I talked about earlier. And we have um, five divisions within our organization uh, that are led uh, by either a general officer in one case or senior executives in, in uh, three cases and a GS-15 uh, in another case. And those, those organizations are focused on delivering the quality services to our soldiers, our families, the civilians, soldiers for life that are on all of our installations globally. So uh, we have an IT directorate that looks at uh, all, of the insta- all the IT responsibilities and, and uh, cybersecurity on our installations. We have an installation services directorate led by an, a senior executive that looks at all the base operating services to include uh, and environment, and we, we manage all the BRAC, system, the, uh, BRAC facilities across our country that, that uh, we're still trying to close out. We have an operations directorate that's led by a brigadier general. 
uh, and they have a wide range of activities that looks at uh, military construction, the sustainment of our facilities all, all globally across our Army installations. Uh, we look at, uh, as part of that, they also manage energy and utilities. It's a, huge, it's a huge issue for us, particularly as we look at climate change and we look at the things that we're trying to do to, to conserve uh, resources and energy. We have a resource directorate led by an SCS where we manage the $17 billion of resources that our Army provides uh, to manage installations. And that, that really covers everything from military construction, sustainment and, and repairs of facilities to um, services and uh, trash pickup, if you will, to lawn cutting, to gate guards, to daycare centers. Uh, so all the things that happen on an installation are resourced out of that $17 billion that we try to stretch to get the maximum um, benefit for that. And then lastly, we have, uh, led by a GS-15, our, our, our Quality of Life Task Force that really is look, looking at how to lead and, and consolidate for the chief of staff and the secretary, all those things that, that people need to have on installations. And, you know, this is from housing to health care to youth programs to spouse employment um, and supporting resilience and um, focused efforts, particularly in remote locations. So there's a wide range of things that we do uh, within the G9 that touch uh, soldiers, civilians, family members on a daily basis. But we don't do these alone. Um, and we have, you know, we have a, a, a large enterprise beneath that with stakeholders uh, that we, we work with to manage all of those and to bring those and operationalize those for our Army. And, and you talked about the, the other stakeholders in the installation enterprise, because I know there's a lot of entities that, have a, that play a role in that. And can you just talk a little bit more about the relationship between your organization, the, the G9, and the, the rest of the installation enterprise? Yeah, no, it's great. Uh, so uh, when Axim became the G9, uh, with that came a realignment of roles, responsibilities, and functions uh, across the installation enterprise. And, and really, uh, when you think about what that enterprise is, it's, uh, it's, from the, it's from the secretariat level all the way down to installation execution. So uh, Installation Management Commander, MCOM, many people are familiar with, uh, used to be a direct report to the Army staff. But with the re- redesignation of a G9 on the staff, uh, and there was a reorganization that took place where Army Materiel Command uh, took ownership, a, a direct uh, command of IMCOM as part of its, its structure. So we now change the, the governance process uh, of the installations. So what you see now is at the uh, at Echelon, and I, I would say from, you know, the, you have the Army Secretariat of the Installa- uh, Assistant Secretary for um, Environment, Energies and Installation. I.E. and E. You have a G9 at the Army staff level. You have Army Materiel Command, a four-star command, that is now responsible for executing an oversight of installations functions. And then below that, you have Army uh, Installation Management Command, uh, which is responsible for supervising and, ex- uh, and executing the programs all the way down to the installation level. So, at, you know, so across this enterprise, from the secretariat to the army staff to an army, army command to a subordinate command, you have a, a very tightly knitted team uh, that works on behalf of the soldiers and the family members to deliver services and, and capabilities for our installations. I would also say that uh, the G9 in this in, in, uh, installation enterprise just doesn't work with the assistant secretary for IE&E. But we also are responsible for working with the assistant secretary uh, for financial management and comptrollership. Uh, and much of that is because of the way functions are, are broken out uh, and the oversights and the policies uh, across our staff. So with FM and C, we look at appropriated and non-appropriated funds and how those are managed. Um, and that's, you know, uh, related to how we execute the, the IIPEG $17 billion dollars. And we look at the auditability of our of our forces and our real property. When you go over to the uh, quality of life part of what we do and the soldier family and readiness pieces, then uh, we have a responsibility to work with the assistant secretary for manpower and reserve affairs on all of the quality of life 
and the soldier readiness programs. So collectively, uh, this is a pretty broad enterprise uh, that needs to be knitted together. Uh, and, you know, we see ourselves in the G9 as responsible for coordinating and integrating all of those functions from the secretariat level uh, through the Army staff down to MCOM, down, or in, I'm sorry, AMC, down through to MCOM. So it's a team. It is a team effort all the way up and down the line. We have great uh, team members and great, great folks uh, that work. Uh, on a daily basis to deliver services to our army. And I wanted to follow up on something you said earlier when you were describing your organization. You said that the majority of the uh, people who work in G9 were members of the Army Civilian Corps. And I just want to ask you, because you, you've been working around the Army for uh, many years and and in your time in the army, how have you seen the role of army civilians change? Yeah, David, that's 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 a really great question. I think we have seen change uh, of the civilians' role in our army. You know, I, I think when you go back and take a look at the history of of civilians in our army, you know, there's probably about a 230 year record of service uh, to our army by civilians in, in in some way, shape, or form since the formation of our army. But I, I think it wasn't until about 2006 when the Army Civilian Corps was really designated uh, by the chief and the secretary. And it wasn't until recently in 2019 when the civilian Army civilians were really truly recognized formally as part of the Army profession. So uh, and that was really captured in uh, the Army's leadership manual of ADP 6-22. So there has been a change um, of our Army civilians. Um, not just from the start all the way up until recently. Uh, and in my career, uh, nearly 40 years of service, both in uniform and as a civilian, I've seen a, a real fundamental shift too in how Army civilians uh, have changed over, over my time. I would tell you that as a young officer uh, in uniform, I, I wasn't sure what civilians did. I saw them. Um, I, I knew that they were there. They, they did a lot of things. I always wasn't sure what they were doing. Um, but as I grew uh, through the ranks and, and matured much more in the mid-grade and senior grades, I, I began to recognize the, the, the real contributions of Army civilians. You know, we talked about them being part of uh, continuity and stability of our Army. Uh, but, you know, uh, they've also been leaders of our Army, and they lead at all levels. Uh, and so I think in the last 20 years especially, uh, was as we've had, uh, you know, we saw what took place in uh, since the early since 2001. That was a significant uh, change for our army in many ways. Uh, civilians have taken on greater and greater responsibilities to, uh, within our army, and I think today our army civilians are really truly embraced uh, with with and by the army culture and by our uniform leaders. They're indispensable within our army, uh, and. Many organizations are led by civilians. Many organizations are predominantly civilians. I would tell you that, you know, G9, as I said, is, is predominantly a civilian organization. Their contributions uh, are critical to, to the day-to-day -day functions of our Army. And so our civilian stands shoulder to shoulder with our uniform counterparts. And, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's the, the comments and the statements of, you know, one team, one fight is really true for our Army civilians uh, today. There's been a lot of change. It's been all positive. I, and, you know, from my perspective as a civilian now uh, for the last 10 years, um, I think that, you know, when you take a look at what civilians do on a daily basis, uh, they truly are uh, significant contributing members to our Army and, and what we do. And, um, and I think that they should be proud of the contributions they make on a daily basis. And you talked about uh, ADP 622 just now. And uh, one of the things that 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 ushered in was the, the, the addition to the civilian creed of the word leadership. And I would just like to get your thoughts about uh, leadership and leader development and why those are important for us uh, as, and, and the folks out there in the leader up audience, why is leadership and leader development important for us uh, as members of the army civilian Corps? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great, that's a great point. So I do have in front of me the Army's uh, civilian creed, and it wasn't until 2019 uh, that, that leadership was added as part of the civilian creed. It used to be that we would talk about civilians uh, as the continuity or the bridge 
um, between uniform leadership. But even then, civilians were providing leadership. Uh, it just wasn't necessarily captured as part of the creed or as part of our uh, formal leadership manuals, and it is today. So I think that's absolutely um, spot on. Uh, and leadership really gets to the heart of what we do as an army. It, it, is, it is one of the fundamental core competencies and strengths of our army. And you know, as civilians, as part of our profession, um, we should be prepared to lead uh, we need to be able to practice the art of leadership. I mean, it's when you think about what leadership is about, it's the it's really it's defined as the activity of influencing people by providing purpose, direction and motivation to accomplish the mission and improve the organization. These are the fundamental things that we do on a daily basis as civilians to. So, you know, we need to be prepared to, to step up and take leadership. I mean, when you think about it. Across our Army Civilian Corps, we've got over 38,000 Army civilians who serve as supervisors, and that is technically a leadership role. And so we've got over 38,000 civilians exercising leadership uh, in our Army. And they exercise that leadership not only uh, on civilians that they oversight, but there are many uniformed personnel, too, that they provide that, that uh, oversight of. And, you know, the other part of the thing about leadership, too, is many civilians... Uh, may or may not recognize us, but they self-select to do this. I mean, we we as civilians self-select for that responsibility. So we need to be prepared uh, to to in, to at various grades and through professional development opportunities uh, to prepare our civilians to take on those leadership responsibilities as part of their career ladder development. Uh, when you get down to it, I think leaders, you know, for, from from a civilian perspective. We are the leaders that will see that long-term change in our army. We are that, you know, yes, we are that we provide leadership, we provide stability, and we provide continuity. And all that's a positive thing about how we enable our army to move forward. So we will be able to, we are the ones that are going to be charged and trusted to actually operationalize and see through that long-term leadership or in that long-term change that our army is, uh, is, is trying to accomplish. And let, let me switch gears a little bit, uh, if I may, and talk about something that's happened uh, very recently over the past year, year and a half, and that's uh, the, the Army's standing up of ACMA, the Army Civilian Career Management Activity, which uh, is is going to, to see the Army streamline the career programs into career fields. And uh, I just recently did a podcast with some folks from ACMA but I, I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on that because you, you are, and correct me if I'm wrong, both a, a functional advisor and a functional chief for a career field. And so just what, what's your role in that and why is that important uh, in the year 2021 and 2022 for the Army Civilian Corps? Yeah, no, it's a great, great question, David. I think... Um, so I am the functional uh, chief for the installations career field, which comprises uh, four functional communities of uh, uh, CP of C uh, functional community twelve, which is on safety. Uh, uh, functional community twenty seven, which is about housing. Functional career uh, twenty nine, um, installation management, and sixty four, which is aviation. And I also serve as the functional advisor for uh, installation management. And so for me, I think this, um, this change uh, is about coordinating and centralizing and bringing coherence to uh, talent management of our, of our uh, civilian uh, career fields and trying to optimize the resources that are necessary. Uh, or that are provided to help folks to further develop. I mean, when you know, the part of this whole career uh, program or this functional communities and the career field uh, consolidation effort is really focused about leader development and talent management. I, you know, I mean, there's the the old adage that uh, leaders aren't born, they're made is, is really true. And this is part of what I think this career field effort is, you know, this consolidation of ACMA is trying to do is trying to build leader development opportunities uh, as well as provide functional career expertise to our civilian 
uh, our civilian uh, professionals. Uh, you know, when you represent these 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 uh, functional communities, uh, one of the responsibilities I have, you know, and and not only me, but you know, all the other uh, functional chiefs of the other eleven. Uh, there's there's eleven functional uh, chiefs. Now, our responsibility is really to look at these the, these career fields and to try to provide them the the best opportunities for development. To to look overlook and provide operational direction and guidance to provide governance of that process uh, and to support the professional development goals and recommend improvements and policy changes that allow our uh, civilian professionals to grow and develop and, ex- and, and climb those uh, career ladders as far as they want to go uh, with their, uh, with, based on their capabilities. And, you know, if, if we want to do this, this is, this is providing those that are willing the opportunities uh, to continue to grow. Um, you know, I think it's only through focused talent management that we can really do this. And so you have to you have to focus those resources and those opportunities uh, to get the most out of what we are. We have a declining resources. I mean, there's it's very clear that uh, we don't have an unlimited budget and we have to we have to use uh, the tools that we have in the most effective ways. Um, so I think as leaders, one of our responsibilities as part of this process in this ACMA consolidation um, is to, to help identify and advance those uh, using the tools that we have and giving people uh, opportunities to continue to develop themselves. Uh, previous approaches were very decentralized. Uh, I think that, uh, and, and they probably didn't achieve the outcomes that they were intending to. And though even ACMA is only a year old, I think we're off to a great start. Okay. And I, I would like to also ask you about uh a little bit more about your your role uh, in, in the G nine, and because you're, you're at a level, you're you're at what what some people would would think of as the enterprise level, because you're looking out over kind of the whole of the Army enterprise, and and when we look at leadership at, at a level like that, leading at the enterprise level, what does that mean for you? Yeah, so the enterprise level really is, uh, I think you could also probably call it the strategic level. Uh, it's about taking a broader view of all the challenges that we face. I mean, enterprise leaders, uh, in my view, connect the dots, uh, both inside and outside uh, the organization. Uh, enterprise leaders are, in, are you know, really about broader outcomes and trying to get the, and trying to see the bigger picture. Uh, you know, it's very easy to focus on um, a particular part of the organization that is looking down and in uh, and sometimes forgetting that the accomplishments of those organizations or the effects of those outcomes um, really have a broader, you know, uh, effect across our army. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like dropping a pebble into a pond, right? The, the pebble goes to the bottom, it's, it drops down but the ripples go out. And so part of being an enterprise leader is to understand where those ripples are going and how to manage those so that you get the best outcomes. Um, you know, and leading at that, at that level, quite frankly, requires um, the ability to assess broader implications. As I said, uh, it's, it's, gotta, it's about willingness to lead change. And I know people get a little nervous when we con- constantly talk about change, but Change is really the only constant in what we're dealing with right now. So at the, as an enterprise leader, you have to embrace change, look for new opportunities and, and look for better ways to accomplish things uh, because we are not standing still as an army. We're, we're constantly moving forward. Enterprise leaders have to build coalitions vertically and horizontally. You have to be able to reach out across uh, various organizations and structures to build those relationships and networks that enable you to accomplish the the, the requirements and the and uh, the functions that you have, and then you know it's we've talked about leadership. An enterprise leader has to be able to lead uh, at 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 that level, but an enterprise leader also has to be willing to take risk. And I think again, that's a little bit of a sometimes people get a little nervous about that, but you have to be willing to take prudent or calculated risks to to achieve an outcome, and it's. You know, and that sometimes is uh, is a little difficult because we we always aren't unsure what that outcome is going to be. But if you don't test the waters, sometimes if you're not willing to take risks, um, 
you know, you won't, you won't be able to achieve a whole lot. Enterprise leaders, in my view, also have to build the bench. So we've talked a little bit about ACMA. We've talked about leadership and leader development. Enterprise leaders have to identify talent and be, be prepared to, to help advance that talent, the diversity that we have in our organization, uh, to, to build a, future, uh, a bench of future leaders, to move people from thinking about downward activities to thinking more about upward and outward activities to ensure that we can keep a constant strategic focus. The, the world is, uh, everything we do is complex, um, and you have to be able to manage that complexity. So uh, an enterprise leader uh, has a lot on their plate, uh, but it doesn't mean that they don't also recognize that there's other activities happening around them and they have to be able to, to connect those dots uh, for their bosses and, you know, and, and for the betterment of the Army. And so that's, that's about leading at the enterprise level. I, I'd like to ask you about may, maybe a little narrower about your role as a member of the senior executive service and specifically the, the symbol of the senior executive service, which is that keystone. And I, I, I've just always found it interesting that that was selected to represent, uh, that, that body of, of professionals. And so that, that keystone symbol, that's the symbol of the senior executive service. What does that mean to you? And, and how does that inform, uh, your, uh, you're doing your job. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I think, um, so, you know, the SES core was, was, was really came into being in about 1978. Uh, and it was really designed to be that executive management function for the government, uh, to, to respond to the needs and the policies and the goals of the nation and to be that bridge between, uh, career civilians and the political leadership. And so that keystone, as you mentioned, David, uh, you know, that symbol is, you know, if you think about it in terms of an arch, you know, and, and SESs are that, that bridge or that arch, that keystone is really the center that holds up the, all other stones of that arch. Um, and, and so SES has served that function uh, as, that, as that keystone, that middle, that middle uh, piece uh, between that political leadership and the, the rest of the professionalized civilian workforce that we have. Um, and, and that's an interesting place to be uh, in many ways, uh, because you, you need to be able to, to um, coordinate, communicate, and, and connect to uh, that, that political leadership. So first off, you know, as we all recognize, SESs are apolitical, all right? We, you know, we are apolitical in what we do. We, our responsibility is to carry out the, the directives that are handed to us um, to the best of our ability. And so uh, that being that linkage means you also have to translate political direction and policy into something that the civilian professionals, uh, our civilian core professionals can actually execute. Um, so it's that it, the SES has provide that leadership, but they also provide uh, technical skills as well. So, you know, across our SES core, we have not just SES leaders, but we have technical experts that are, you know, whether it's uh, intelligence or other uh, science and technology backgrounds, you have some that are very specialized. Um, but but the SESs, not just within the Department of Defense, but across our entire government are that linkage. And, you know, in, interesting within the DOD, while we have, you know, we have SESs and we also have general officers. So we have a complementary role within the DOD. When you go outside of the DOD, you really just have SESs uh, that are that link. So, uh, so within the DOD, we have great, you know, we are partnered with general officers. Outside of the DOD, those SESs are the single link uh, between the political and their, and their sub professionalized civilian corps. Uh, but that symbol, uh, it means a lot, uh, you, you know, and when you, when you accept that symbol as an SES, uh, you have to recognize you're taking on an awful lot of responsibility and you have to be willing to do that and, and serve in that capacity as that keystone or that center stone to be that bridge uh, between that political leadership and, and the civilian, uh, our civilian core professionals who rely on us uh, to do our jobs on a daily basis to provide that leadership uh, and oversight um, and, and do so in a nonpartisan way. 
And I, I really do appreciate that that response. Thank you for that that clarity. And um, I'd like to ask you about some some drill down really into some leadership topics. Uh, th- and these are kind of things that I used to hear a lot in the classroom, in the basic course and in the intermediate course, because I I I interacted with a lot of uh, Army civilians, and wh- one of the things that that I heard a lot was that was a challenge was delegation. And I just want to get your thoughts on why is delegation important? Uh, What makes it challenging? And is is it still something that you are mindful of uh, at your level to to use delegation properly? Yeah, no, hey, absolutely. I I see delegation as one of of my uh, personal, uh, hopefully one of my personal strengths. And for those that have worked for me before, will hopefully acknowledge that I, I because here's here's what I'll tell you. Um, delegation is an essential part of a good leader, and and you know, my personal approach to delegation is is uh, and I've told people this. I tell folks that work for me, um, I will delegate to the point of being uncomfortable, and I think that's a positive statement. And so what I tell them is, I want you to be empowered. I want you to accept the tasks and accomplish the tasks, and don't feel like you're being micromanaged. Um, you know, the, the, the part about delegation is really about giving people opportunity to succeed. And when you delegate to folks, you, you, you actually are telling them two things. Uh, number one, I trust you. And trust is absolutely important in, in, our, in our business. When, when we are as civilians, we have to have trust in each other. And if I'm delegating actions and functions to you, I am trusting you to do the task. Uh, and to and to execute the authorities that I'm giving you as part of that delegation, uh, and and so you know when you do that, you're, you're actually um, also providing what I think the second part of this is. You're providing uh, development. You know, as we've talked a little bit before about leadership, by delegating the responsibilities and functions, I'm also giving people an opportunity to develop and. You know, if if we're going to develop leaders and we're going to develop people who are critical thinkers and innovative uh, and who have and, and, you know, who can do things, you have to be able to delegate uh, responsibilities or or actions to them. Not that as a a senior leader, I'll ever um, I will never, uh, uh, you know, uh, walk away from the responsibility and accountability for what I delegate to people. I, I will always. And I think all senior leaders are the same way. You know, we will always maintain that responsibility and accountability for the outcome, um, good or bad. But delegation is, in my view, is absolutely critical. Um, and, and part of that delegation is to ensure people understand, you know, it's not just carte blanche, go off and, and you know, save the world. But you got to but you got to give them a little bit of left and right limits to show them, you know, where the boundaries are, because there are going to be things that they will run into as part of their of, of accomplishing the task. Uh, that they're going to need to come back and either get some direction or as a senior leader, I tell folks, uh, my job is to move the obstacles out of your way so that you can get the ball across the goal line. So if I'm delegating that function to them, I see them as being able to take that ball and run with it all the way through the goal line. And I'm I'm the blocker. I'm moving stuff out of their way so they can get there. Um, and by doing that, I'm also being able to assess their ability to be a future leader. So delegation gives gives me an opportunity and gives other leaders an opportunity uh, to demonstrate trust, to develop folks, and then to assess their capabilities for for uh, increased responsibilities in the future. And ca- kind of in that same uh, category, another topic that I uh, used to hear a lot about when I was in the classroom is feedback. Um, and so at, at your level, at where where you are, and it, just in your experience. What's the importance of feedback within an organization? Yeah, no, great, great question, David. I think um, feedback's key. I mean, you can't function without it. We, you know, when you think about it, we get feedback every day. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, you get feedback on job performance. You get feedback uh, in your personal relationships. Um, you're constantly getting feedback: things that you're doing well, things that you're not doing well, uh, some things that make people happy that don't make people happy. Um, Feedback is absolutely important, it, and, and it's got to have a component to it uh, that is constructive. So, you know, one of the things that um, 
my view of this is that you know leaders have to take the time to provide feedback to to their subordinates. Uh, you know, never be you know as a leader you you should never be too busy or overscheduled to not to be able to provide that thoughtful and constructive feedback to to those that are working for you or that who have asked for that feedback or you believe need to have some feedback in order to help them improve. You know, my experience is that subordinates appreciate that. You know, and feedback doesn't have to be a laundry list of here's the great things you did right and here's all the here's the things you did wrong. Feedback could be just as simple as hey, that was a great job. Thanks for what you've done. It's amazing what that does to to people who have, you know, who who are doing something and appreciate some kind of uh, assessment of their efforts. That value cannot be overstated. But, you know, on a professional level, we have to do that feedback. That's that counseling. It's that ability to help folks develop. Um, and there are multiple tools for that. You know, I mean, you know, as supervisors, you know, you got those 38,000 individual, you know, uh, civilian supervisors out there. You, you've got tools and you've got, you know, DP map. You've got other, other tools uh, personality and leader assessment tools that you can get feedback on and you can use to provide feedback. And David, I know you've got a couple of courses that you all run at, through the, the management staff college uh, that have multiple feedback tools as part of it. And I would encourage folks to take advantage of those, uh, you know, but well, if you don't give feedback to people, you will never see improvement in what they're doing. Thank you for that response. That, uh, that's uh, very enlightening. And in our final moments here, I want to talk first about uh, your path to becoming a member of the senior executive service. Because I, I, I hear people, I hear uh, members of the Army Civilian Corps ask this question, how can I get there? If I'm 30, 35, 40 years old, um, I'm a GS-12, GS-13 somewhere, how can can I get to be a member of the senior executive service or how can I pursue that goal? And so just how, how did you do it? What was your path to getting to where you are in, in your, in your career? Yeah. So, um, yeah, great. Uh, you know, thanks. Um, my, uh, my path to, to being an SES is probably not an unfamiliar one to several, to many SESs. Um, you know, I spent 30 years on active duty. Uh, I was fortunate when I retired because I wanted to continue to serve, uh, to come back, uh, as an, as a member of the army professional, uh, civilian corps as a GS 15. And, and I worked for a while, uh, as a 15. And, you know, again, as I've talked about building the bench, I had SESs and uh, general officers come to me and say, you need to be an SES. We need you to apply to be an SES. Um, so I was, it was never a foregone conclusion or, uh, or any kind of, a um, you know, you know, expectation that I would become an SES, but if you have the willingness to, to, to pursue that, that goal, uh, that's, that's, what's important. Um, you need to be prepared though, by pursuing that goal that you have to recognize the responsibilities that you're going to take on, uh, to be both a leader uh, uh, in the organization and a role model for folks. Uh, so my, you know, so my path, uh, you know, I, I had a couple fits and starts, you know, sometimes you're going to get selected. Sometimes you're, you know, you could get selected, you could not get selected, but I would tell you that no doesn't mean never. Cause you know, as you apply for an SES position, that's the first start. Uh, you have to be selected for a position, but once you're selected as a senior executive, you have mobility across the government. I, I would tell you that, um, you know, so I, I was I was encouraged to become an SES. I went through the process. That process is not uh, insignificant when you think about the uh, executive core qualifications that you have to write and the experiences that you have in your background that you have to contextualize uh, to be uh, to, to demonstrate executive qualities of leading people, leading change, building uh, relation, you know, building coalitions, business acumen, and, and driving results. Uh, you have to be prepared to, to to show what you've done, whether you're a GS 12 or a GS 15. You still have to have those experiences and those qualities. And and you know younger younger folks, uh, I would encourage you to continue to to follow that path to, to be an SES if you have that as an ambition, because we need uh, younger folks in the SES Corps that can serve 
longer as as SESs. Uh, many of us, I mean, I'm you know, I'm I'm a little older, uh, came to this a little later, um, you know, but but younger folks that ha- can build some tenure and can and can uh, contribute at longer levels, uh, longer terms for our army is is exactly what we need. I would tell you a couple things: be committed to the process if you want to do it. Um, recognize and be willing to, to accept the demands. Look for mentorship. Uh, I will tell you that that path to, to SES uh, required some, some me to grab some folks that, you know, to current and former SESs for mentorship. Um, and then, you know, be confident in yourself. Uh, it, you know, don't, uh, and if you, if you get rejected the first time, continue to apply. I mean, even Babe Ruth struck out more than he, he hit, uh, you know, and made it to the Hall of Fame. So. Um, you know, if you want to, if you want to pursue it, uh, you know, call me. I'm glad to give you some advice. Okay. Thank you for that. And, um, in, in our final moments, I want to ask you about some top threes. And the first one that I want to ask you is your top three leadership books that you would recommend, uh, to, to other leaders. Yeah, there's a lot of books out there, David, obviously. And, you know, everybody's got a list of books. There's three that I think that, that you know, because good leaders understand themselves and have a commitment to uh, serve uh, those around them. So I would tell you there's three books that I, I kind of keep on my shelf. One, what got you there? What got you here won't get you there. Um, Marshall Goldsmith. Good to Great by Jim Collins. And Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek. A um, couple of those, I think, you know, but again, there's tons of books out there. There's no silver bullet to leadership. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's about willingness, understanding yourself and a commitment to serve, not to be served. And the, the second top three is your, your top three skills or competencies for army leaders. Yeah. So again, lists are long, <laughs> you know, and there's always a lot of, 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 of debate on these. So for me, the, the things that I value for, for leaders, one, communication skills, both written and verbal. You have to have them. You have to be able to, to articulate uh, what you want and to communicate both up and down, uh, laterally and horizontally in the organization. Um, be authentic. Be who you are. Subordinates will see through self-serving individuals in a heartbeat. And if you have duplicative uh, person, you know, duplicative uh, uh, motives, they'll see through that. So be authentic in what you do. And then the environment around us is changing uh, it constantly. Um, so be agile and adaptive. Uh, if you want to be a good leader, uh, you have to be able to adjust, adapt, and be able to lead your organization through those changes. And then uh, top three skills or competencies for enterprise leaders. Yeah. So you, you can't divorce yourself from the competencies of being an army leader. So you got to, you got to put those on your list. Um, but the three things that I think are important at the enterprise level, and, and you know, I've said, I, you know, willingness to take calculated risk you, and as part of that, be willing for your subordinates to take risk and underwrite the risk that they take as long as it's prudent risk. Um, build relationships laterally, horizontally across the enterprise. That means reaching out to other services, other organizations, build those networks and bridges because you'll need them at the organization, at the enterprise level. And then lastly, enterprise leaders have to think in time. They have to focus on the long term. They have to look at a a vision and focus uh, at the long term because uh, it takes time to manifest outcomes. And your top three leadership lessons learned? Yeah, great question, David. I think, um, you know, over the years, uh, there are many things that that leaders learn, but I think a few stand out to me. Um, One, I think as a senior leader, you have to recognize that uh, you live in a glass house. So what you do is viewed by all. So I would tell you, the first thing is be careful what you ask for. Um, Words have meanings. Uh, And so you're likely to get what you ask for in many cases. So be clear whether you're thinking out loud or whether you're actually giving direction uh, because people will do what you ask them to do. Um, So be be clear and careful about what you ask for. Uh, The second thing is the golden rule, right? Treat others as you want to be treated. Uh, Treat them with dignity and respect uh, because, you know, again, 
leaders serve, they're not served. Um, and then the third thing I, I think is uh, take the hard right, because there will be a lot of easy ways out of, 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 of problem sets, but there's a few, but, but the hard right, even when it's difficult, um, is, is important as a leader. You have to set the tone. And, and that includes everything from tough calls within an organization to discipline calls to, to uh, making sure that you, you stay within the ethical and, and legal boundaries of what you're doing, even though the outcome may not be exactly what you want. But uh, take that hard right over the easy wrong. And so thank you, Mr. Daniel Klipstein, on behalf of our Leader Up audience. Thank you so much for, for giving us your time and, and sharing your thoughts about these issues. And, sir, I'm just going to turn it over to you for whatever final uh, thoughts uh, you have to share with us. Yeah. Hey, thanks, David. I, I really, and I just like to say that, uh, you know, maybe in closing, uh, I want to thank all of our great army civilian leaders and, and civilian professionals out there for what they do on a daily basis. Cause you make the army what it is. Um, you know, the chief of staff talks a lot about, um, you know, winning matters. And, and in fact, that really is the true case, but in order to win, you have to have people and it is about people and it is about taking care of folks. It's about leading uh, and it's about making sure people feel valued in what they do and they see the value in what they provide uh, to our army. So, you know, thanks again uh, for this opportunity um, and uh, look forward maybe to coming back at another time. And so once again, thank you, Mr. Daniel Klipstein, for being with us today on Leader Up and Leader Up audience out there. Uh, what do you think about what Mr. Klipstein had to say to us as members of the Army Civilian Corps. Please join us again next time for another edition of Leader Up. As always, if you have any questions or feedback or would like to learn more about our podcast, please check the description for our email and for our website. Thanks for listening.